Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is no boilerplate focusing on fast, technical videos. We live in an incredible age. We all have the 90s equivalent of supercomputers in our pockets. Computers have never been so fast, but it doesn't feel like it, right? It's not you. Computing has been getting worse in lots of subtle ways. Note that I don't say computers are getting worse, it's computing, the act of using a computer, that is getting worse. Computer hardware is much, much faster and much, much cheaper than most people realise. The problem is laptops. There are staggering discrepancies between laptops and desktops, even with very small desktops like this mini PC on the left here. The problem is thermal limits. A problem that it is impossible to solve in laptops. Everything you see in this video, script, links, and images are part of a Markdown document available freely on GitHub under a public domain license. Part 1. Hardware. It was not too long ago, perhaps 15 years, about when I started my career in web development, that most people did their computing on workstations, desktop computers with a separate monitor, keyboard, and mouse. Artists, programmers, designers, video editors, musicians, educational YouTubers, and producers and makers of all kinds. Laptops were simply not powerful enough for the graphics design, video editing, and compiling of large programming projects that we needed to do. Laptops were for simple, portable tasks, browsing the web and writing, good for lecture notes, but it was understood that real work often had to happen on a desktop. Then a calamity was visited upon the world. Laptops became just fast enough to work for nearly everything you might want to do. If you're looking for a watershed moment, I would point to Intel Atom's 2008 release as the beginning of the end. Laptop performance and battery life became just slightly better than mediocre, and that, combined with most apps being offloaded to someone else's computer, accessed by the browser, allowed laptops to flourish, and hardware manufacturers pivoted to focusing almost entirely on this popular form factor. Today, nothing has changed. Desktops, powerful workstation machines, still eclipse laptops in performance. Ask any PC gamer. Desktop performance has not stood still while laptop performance has increased. We just stopped paying attention to it. They have both increased together, with desktops maintaining their enormous lead. With a desktop, you still get much more for your money, despite innovations in portable computing power. The problem is physics. Miniaturization of components to fit into a sleek, light laptop is not without compromise. Heat is the problem. A laptop has a very small fan and a very small mass of copper for the heatsink. There is only so many kilos of copper the consumer is willing to carry with them. It is deeply compromised for the amount of heat a high-performance task will kick out of the CPU and GPU. It's simple physics. Electrical power in, computing power, and heat out. If you want more computing power, you must increase the electricity input, which creates more heat. The N coefficient here represents miniaturization and cooling of the processor. Smaller processors mean less distance for the electrons to travel, which means less heat, less literal friction of the electrons moving in the wire. But we're coming up against hard limits in how small we can make our processors if we don't switch away from silicon. If you can't make them smaller, you must make them slower. The manufacturer's solution to the problem of heat is to make the laptop chips worse. Same price as the desktop version, dramatically worse performance. Same model numbers as their desktop counterparts, dramatically worse performance. And even when the laptop chips have similar base performance in real load testing at room temperatures, the chip heats up and starts throttling speed to save itself from meltdown. Take the MacBook Air M2 and the MacBook Pro M2. These machines have exactly the same CPU inside them, and for the first moment of the benchmark, have the same performance. But look at the fanless MacBook Air's speed fall apart as time goes on and it heats up. That's thermal throttling. And while all CPUs do it, standard desktop hardware simply doesn't have the prison of thermal constraints that laptops do. Unfortunately, it's not just about the physical constraints of the form factor. We're forced into slow hardware, also by economic sleight of hand. On the left is the cheapest MacBook Pro M3. On the right is the same machine specced with 64GB of RAM and 4TB of disk. See my source code for the CPU differences between the two, but I'll remind you it's unimpressive. Upgrading a PC with this amount of RAM and disk should cost about $300, but this MacBook upgrade costs $3,300, 11 times more. Apple can charge these prices because you can't upgrade the machines yourself. No one can. Not even Apple. The RAM and disk are non-upgradable. 
Whereas my favourite PC memory company, Crucial, will sell you 64GB of RAM for $100, and 4TB of M2 SSD for $200. This is a real problem for people who want powerful hardware and don't know that Apple are not playing fairly. I have a great deal more to say about Apple, but I had to cut my three-minute unhinged rant short for this video. If you'd like to watch the fuller version, it's on my Patreon here. It's just me making these videos, and I'm so grateful to everyone for supporting me so far. I have big plans for 2024. As a patron, you can see and give feedback on my videos up to a week early, vote on future topics, as well as access private Discord areas, and even get your name in the credits. I'm also offering a limited number of mentoring slots. If you'd like one-to-one -one tuition on Rust, creative production, web tech, personal organization, or anything that I talk about in my videos, do sign up and let's chat. Thank you so much. To be clear, I don't hate laptops for mobile work. I wrote this script on a train using one. I dislike the assumption that they must be used everywhere, even when portability isn't needed at all. I don't hate MacBooks either. I'll take one over a Windows laptop any day of the week, but I'd always prefer a Linux laptop. Or even better than that, a Linux desktop. What hardware do I recommend, then? Desktop PCs. Cheap desktop machines from five years ago are much faster compared to even the latest high-powered laptops for a quarter of the price. How do they do this? It's simple economics. Choice is good for the consumer. Have you ever wondered why desktops all look the same? Unlike laptops, where the manufacturer designs the layout of the internals differently for each model, making spare parts obsolete every year, desktops have a standard interchangeable layout with standard interchangeable parts. This means that next year you can double your RAM or disk storage trivially, and then again the year after that. You don't have to throw away the whole machine. What about laptops for mobile use or meetings? Firstly, you're having too many meetings. See my pinned video for details. Secondly, you mostly work from home or a fixed office location, right? And lastly, if you're at the kind of company or school that requires lots of in-person meetings or lectures, plenty do, buy yourself a really inexpensive lightweight laptop or tablet in addition to your inexpensive powerful desktop workstation for this purpose. We've got Wi-Fi everywhere for a reason. Don't shackle yourself to a slow laptop just because you need to type notes on the go from time to time. Chromebooks are ideal for this purpose. They cost basically nothing and are perfect for companies and schools as they can be easily shared. Each meeting room could have a stack charged and ready to use. They even run Linux. Typing on a laptop is terrible for us. Touchpads are terrible for us. A small screen down at table height is terrible for us. We're killing ourselves in small ways, and we must stop this instant. And if you're buying for your team, it's insanity to oblige them to injure themselves for the sake of these slow, expensive machines. The laptop form factor of a screen built into the lid covering the keyboard and touchpad is genius. It's the standard for a reason, but it sacrifices so much on the altar of portability. If you don't need portability, you will be best served by a desktop computer. And you usually don't need portability. So, you've got cheap, powerful hardware, but you don't want to run Windows, right? No. The next step is to pair powerful hardware with the best operating system on the planet, Linux. Part 2. Software. Linux runs lightning fast on the desktop, isn't beholden to Microsoft for Windows updates or Apple and Xcode for basic libraries, and can run on any computer you like. If you use an AMD graphics card, you don't even need graphics drivers, the Linux kernel has them built in. And if you already do most of your work inside a web browser, Google Chrome is available here too, as well as my favourite, Firefox. My day-to-day -day OS has been Ubuntu Linux since 2007, and I switched my music production to Linux on the 26th of March 2014 when Bitwig was released, a gig-ready, fully-featured Ableton Live clone. If you're a musician, check it out. I've written multiple albums since then purely on Linux. I do all my podcast audio editing on Linux too, using the excellent editor Reaper, which I can't say enough good things about, and it's made by the guy who created Winamp. Reaper can also edit video, with both hardware-accelerated FFmpeg and VLC backends providing speed and hardware support that Final Cut and Premiere can only dream of. I'm editing this video right now in Reaper. All of this works on any Linux machine. My whole production pipeline could run from a solar panel on a Raspberry Pi. And it goes without saying that a cheap machine with a really fast CPU and 32 gigabytes of RAM is just what I need for my day-to-day -day programming and playing games. The last reason to keep Windows around, gaming, has been slowly eroded since Valve integrated Proton, a zero-config Linux compatibility layer, into Steam. I remember celebrating when I first trivially ran Skyrim on this system in 2018. The last nail in the coffin for Windows gaming was when Valve released the Steam Deck, running Linux and Proton natively at the start of last year. 
Now all my games play great on Linux, on deck or on my PC, and I have no Windows devices in the entire house. Linux even has a noticeable speed improvement on the same hardware compared to Windows. This makes sense, because I'm sure Microsoft have a good team working on making Windows fast, but Linux has the entire world developing it. Linux is a democratically built operating system. This means the annoyances that Microsoft and Apple oblige you to accept don't exist. There's no pop-ups offering you add-ons you don't need, forcing restarts after updates, or charging for updates and features that should be standard. No sending your data off to trusted third parties for processing and steering you towards their own products and away from better alternatives. Microsoft Edge and iTunes, I'm looking at you. And if there are features you don't like, you turn them off. It's your computer. You know best, not some company. Linux doesn't have a corporate agenda with shareholders expecting value extraction. It's a democratic, open community. Let me quickly highlight the first thing that sold me on Linux years ago, the ubiquitous built-in package manager. If you've used Brew on OS X or Winget on Windows, they're cute toy imitations of a real Linux package manager. You don't have to go hunting on the web or app store for a program to install. It's as easy as apt install VS Code or Firefox or Steam. In a single command, you could install all the programs you need onto a new machine or your friend's machine. The same process does system updates and hardware drivers, and all without requiring constant restarts or locking of your computer. The Mac Terminal and Windows WSL are poor imitations of this liberating environment. Linux is a universal operating system, and you can even install it on a Mac, though I don't recommend it. Here's the MacBook Air I tried out for three months. At the start of this year, I tested Asahi Linux on Apple Silicon, but the experiment only lasted three months. Apple's hardware was not the revolution in performance that their marketing pretended it to be. Better than most laptops? Sure. But that's not where real performance has ever been. If you want the performance that any cheap gaming PC has on a laptop, prepare to pay much, much more for it. Why not build your own PC? If Cavill himself can do it, so can you. Search YouTube for budget PC gaming builds and you'll find loads of simple recommendations to get started. Here's mine. Buy the mini PC from the start of this video and call it a day. Whatever you build or buy, try Ubuntu. It's easy to install on any machine. Have fun. If you would like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos, VIP Discord access, or one-to-one -one mentoring, head to patreon.com forward slash noboilerplate. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk stories, please check out my weekly sci-fi podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, do listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce every full moon called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and compile-checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.